So welcome to the webinar, Treatment Planning and Restorative Steps for Resin-Based All on X. It is being presented by Tremaine Watkins, CDT, and we are going to begin this webinar shortly. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Tremaine Watkins, CDT. He has been working in the dental laboratory industry for more than 30 years. After graduating with a Bachelor of Arts from Trinity College in Issaquah, Washington, as class valedictorian, he has gained extensive experience in all aspects of fixed and removable restorations with an emphasis on implant-supported and retained restorations. He also has provided clinical support in case planning, troubleshooting, and implant placement. He has trained other technicians in all aspects of dental technology and has written and lectured on several aspects of restorative dentistry. And now tonight, you get to hear the passion we get to see every day. Take it away, Tremaine. Thank you very much, Jessica. Holy smokes, if I get to meet the guy from that, that'd be awesome. No. Um, I really appreciate everybody coming out tonight. I hope you guys will, everyone will get a nugget or two out of this. Um, as you guys know, All on X is a huge topic and um, there are multi-day webinars. So what I wanted to do was kind of focus on an overview of the restorative steps, kind of narrow it down to things that we can do with resin and hopefully give you kind of a method for working with patients that come into your office looking for this treatment. So we'll start off with a couple of uh, housekeeping slides. I'm a full-time employee of National Dentex Corporation, and um, I have received, been paid by them for the time that it's taken to prepare for this presentation. However, I don't have any uh, financial support from any other vendors or anything like that. So without further ado, let's get going here. So we're gonna be talking about, as I mentioned, resin-based implant-supported full arch restorations, otherwise known as all on X. We'll cover two basic classes of prosthetics, overdentures and hybrids. We're gonna call an overdenture a removable prosthetic that is supported by two or more dental implants. Technically, as you guys know, an overdenture can be supported by teeth or retained roots with attachments, but these treatment methodologies are not as common today with uh, dental implants becoming more prevalent. Um, overdentures can also be supported by several single implants with attachments or a splinted bar, as my little picture here shows. Uh, we'll talk about both options. I would say that today an acrylic hybrid is still the most common type of screw-retained, implant-supported full-arch prosthetic, all on X. Acrylic hybrids contain a titanium bar, which is surrounded by acrylic resin and teeth. There are a variety of materials options for screw-retained all on X, of course, and we'll mention some briefly. However, in the interest of time and kind of to narrow the scope of our presentation, uh, we'll focus on acrylic hybrids as our screw retained option. So let's say a patient comes into your office and says, I want implants, which as you guys know, today seems to mean I want an all on X restoration. Where do you start with the case? What are you're gonna be your most important factors when you're evaluating the patient? And what decisions do you need to make and where to start? There's a saying that you hear a lot in dentistry, I think, which is when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I feel like that's especially relevant in all on X. We all have our preferred treatment me methodologies for full arch, and there's nothing wrong with having a great process that achieves really good results. On the other hand, these patients are probably gonna be the most varying of any that you deal with both because of patient variability and just because of the comprehensive nature of the restoration. And so it's helpful to have some other tools that you can use so that you can deal with these uh, patient variations. So tonight we're gonna look at some of the options that are available and we'll talk about the ways to get choose the best solutions for your patients. So I think when we get started with this, so when our patient comes in the door, we need to ask three basic questions to choose the best option. The questions interact with each other, so we'll cover each question individually, then discuss how we might put those answers together for a given patient to uh, develop a treatment plan. First, we need to decide whether we'll use a fixed or removable restoration. There are a few components to this question. 
first, we need to understand what our patients want. I mean, that sounds basic, but I think many of us, because of our expertise, we sometimes are like, well, I know what you want. I know what you need. And we can kind of miss that step of really hearing what our patients want. And I think the other thing is that in the marketplace, there seems to be a bias towards fixed restorations and mass marketing. It's interesting, though, the limited number of studies that have been done, that I've seen at least, that show patients having the opportunity to wear both a custom-made fixed restoration and a custom-made removable restoration, the split's about 50-50 on which one they choose to keep. So I think that for those of us that, like myself, that come from the fixed side, we kind of need to keep an ear open both to our patients and then also to their clinical situation because there may be those who will be best served by removable restoration. So that's the first aspect of this. The second aspect is your clinical assessment of how did your patient get to the situation that you see them in now? If you see evidence of long-term poor dental hygiene, um, you know, periodontal disease, widespread decay, all those things, it's probably prudent to start thinking about a removable solution. Patients who have a lifetime habit of poor hygiene may not be willing or even more able to change at this point. Um, so as you guys know, a screw retained prosthetic is very difficult to keep clean. And people tell you sometimes what you want to hear, but you want to make sure that that if people make a commitment to change that you believe them, because if they won't do the care that's necessary, as you know, you can have a very big failure without a lot of awesome options. Um, if your patient has evidence of good dental care and tooth loss due to bruxism or systemic disease, um, you might be able to use either solution. Um, if you're dealing with bruxers, you may even find that a fix would be better just because you can use zirconia to resist those forces. Finally, you need to look at the current gingival position and see if the crest of the ridge is visible at the high smile. If so, you'll need to perform alveoplasty for a fixed restoration or use a removable restoration of the flange. We need to make sure that the transition line, which is the line between the prosthetic and the gingiva, so this area right here, um, does not show when the person smiles. If that happens, it's an aesthetic nightmare. One other thing to keep in mind is that the needles moved a little bit with removables, I feel like, in the last few years. Not that long ago, a patient had to choose between either a very stable fixed restoration or a less stable removable restoration. Now we have some technologies that are removable and stable, so that really can be taken off the table as a potential conflict. So anyhow, putting all those pieces together, we kind of need to figure out what do we think is going to be the best kind of restoration for our patient. Our second major consideration in all on X is restorative space. So let's start with a definition. One of the things that I think can be difficult in these cases is you'll find terms that are used for a variety of different things. Um, that's what I like about all on X as a term is that it is a non-brand specific way of talking about these procedures when so many of the terms are driven by the implant company that manufactures the components they want you to use. Um, restorative space, I feel like in some ways is like that. Uh, the definition we want to use tonight and the one that I would say is the most common is the space between the alveolar ridge where the implant platforms are gonna be placed and the plane of occlusion of the final restoration. Um, if you can't visualize the bone, uh, either physically, obviously, or uh, in a CBCT scan, uh, you may, if you have to measure from the tissue, you need to add an allowance to the tissue. So let's say you measure from the occlusal plane to the tissue and you see nine millimeters in general, um, I would say you'll add two millimeters to that and say that, so your restorative space is 11 millimeters. Now, why do people talk about restorative space and why is it so important? You know, patients, you guys know that when patients have an implant-supported restor 
vibration, they lose most of their sense of proprioception. Based on many studies, we found that there are significantly higher occlusal loads on all on X restorations and on natural teeth. Because our restorations must resist this increased force, the strength of that restoration is paramount for the success of the cases. And since the amount of restorative space dictates the thickness of the final restoration and thus its strength, because as we know in dental, vertical height is the greatest component of material strength, um, we have to get enough space. If we decide to start a case with inadequate restorative space, probably the implants will be fine, but the continual breakage of the prosthetic is gonna be a source of frustration for both you and the patient. Um, decisions about materials also affect restorative space. Different materials require a different amount of space. Sometimes you can have a situation where you can deliver a certain material with no alveoplasty or, or you'll need to do significant alveoplasty for another case, another type of material. So in those situations, you may decide to use the material that can be made thinner. Uh, keep in mind that you can't change your plan then down the road. Like if you decide, well, I'm gonna do the case out of zirconia because I only have 12 millimeters or 11 millimeters restorative space. And then you decide to switch to a hybrid well, those three millimeters of space that you don't have are going to be a big problem. Um, so whether or not you have to do alveoplasty obviously is a large factor in the cost of the case. And you'll need to kind of think about that when you're presenting the case to the patient and when you're working out your pricing with your colleagues. Um, another important factor is existing implants. So oftentimes existing implants have been done to support a single tooth or maybe a three in a bridge. And so the restorative re space requirements for those are much less. So you may decide, you know what, that implant looks really healthy. I have enough space for a over an inch style restoration. I'm going to use that so I don't have to remove the implants. Um, on the other hand, you may decide, well, the patient really wants fixed. And even though these implants are well integrated, they don't give me the restorative space that I need and I need to remove them. So it's nice to have existing implants, but we wanna make sure that we don't compromise the case to save an implant or two. Um, so that's really important. One often overlooked source of restorative space is lost vertical dimension of occlusion. Many of our patients have lost video as they've lost both teeth and bone. And so when we're looking at our restorative space, we need to look at the space between the bone and the proper plane of occlusion, not necessarily the current plane. Since we're usually opening the bite for these patients, we can gain some restorative space this way. And as you can see in this graphic, we can give the patient a dental facelift. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this technique, but I'll mention it just briefly. Um, one way to assess BDO is to have the patient sit up nice and straight in the chair and ask them to relax, maybe do some deep breaths, then ask them to swallow and relax their jaw. Put some fixed points on their nose and chin and take a measurement at this relaxed closed mouth position. When you get a repeatable measurement, that's the vertical dimension of rest. Three millimeters less than that is a good starting place for vertical dimension of occlusion. Once you have that, you can ask the patient to close down and then measure the current closed position. And the difference between those two will show you how much uh, bite opening is needed. Um, I will say that the Conmedier instrument and its replicas have kind of taken the all on X world by storm. That kind of process that I've described, I'm finding people doing it less and less as they're getting good results with that instrument. So something to kind of keep an eye out for there as you're building your armamentarium. So we talked about restorative space and we talked about fixed or removable. Our third major consideration in all on X is anterior posterior spread. Uh, the AP spread can be defined as the distance from the center of the platform of the most anterior implant to the distal of the platform of the most posterior implant. 
Most all-on-X cases have some posterior cantilever. If you're using pterygoid implants, of course, that eliminates that, which is nice. Um, but in general, we're going to be having a little bit of cantilever. This slide, I incorporated it because it shows the older notion that was kind of what we all started out with, which is that we could have a posterior cantilever that was up to one and a half times the AP spread. Now, this is true. From an implant survivability perspective, we can do this and not fear that the cantilever will damage our implants as long as we have appropriate implants and appropriate bone. But what we find as we've been going down this road is that most of the problems with these cases have to do more with prosthetic failure than implant failure. And as we're working through that, we discover that the rules that we've always understood in restorative dentistry, turns out they do still apply in all on X. And posterior cantilevers where bite forces are very, very high and we're creating a lever arm can sometimes be so great that they overwhelm even proper restorative space and a well-designed prosthetic. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that some of the newer uh, restorative materials have limited potential cantil uh, posterior cantilever. You'll find that um, zirconia, oftentimes people talk about maybe a 10 millimeter uh, cantilever. So um, you'll want to keep all that in mind as you're planning out your implants. Again, we get to existing implants because it happens a lot. Not only do we have to think about them for restorative space, but we have to think about AP spread. If they're in a great position, wonderful, but if they're going to cause our prosthetic not to be successful, maybe we need to add some posterior implants or we may need to replace them. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is that many of the re removable options work best with straight parallel implants. Um, we'll talk more about that because there's, um, I would say some asterisks with that. But if we have a patient with severe bone loss and a pneumatized sinus, for instance, on the maxilla, we may require sinus lifts to get the implants in the ideal position for that case. Um, of course, the best way to diagnose our potential AFP spread is with the CBCT scan. So we need to incorporate that scan into our group of records that we'll get together for an all on X case. So we've assessed whether a fixed or removable prosthetic would be best, how much restorative space is currently available, and what AP spread can be achieved. We're ready to make up a treatment plan. So our biggest choice is gonna be how much surgical intervention is necessary. Sometimes for a removable option, you can use a tissue supported surgical guide, punch a tissue and place some parallel implants. This gives you a potentially lower treatment cost. Um, and sometimes you can do as kind of the value option for this, you can do a two implant overdenture with no bone reduction at all. Um, this will help for your patients who need a less expensive option. But again, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but we need to make sure we present the total cost of treatment to these patients. Because generally, as you guys know, the treatments that cost less at the beginning oftentimes are a little more expensive for maintenance. Many all on X cases, on the other hand, are gonna require alveoplasty and the placement of at least four implants. So you're gonna have a more expensive and more extensive surgical procedures. Um, also, you kind of need to look at your restorative space. If you decide to proceed with less than 15 millimeters of restorative space, you've limited your flexibility with the final restoration. So you need to make sure that when you make that choice that you and the patient are happy with it and committed to that result all the way through to the end. So once you've kind of put all this together and decided on the type of treatment to be offered, you've developed a price that's been accepted by the patient, you're ready to proceed with your all on X treatment. So I wanna make explicit something that's been in, implied in our discussion restorative case, which is our full arch cases our best approach from a prosthetically driven perspective. 
In other words, we can only really evaluate the bone present, the AP spread, and the restorative space if we know the desired final tooth position. As you know, there's a wide variety of dental situations for these patients. Some are going to have quite a few teeth that are in a pretty good position. Some might even have a removable prosthetic that has good position. Other ones, not so much. Um, I will say that the sooner you can allow the patient to see what your teeth are going to look like, the sooner you can work out any issues and make sure that you're both happy with where the treatment's going before you start doing things that are irreversible. So maybe that means an immediate denture, um, flipper, bondings, different things like that. So how do you decide if you need a new denture for your edentulous patients or if you can use one that the patient already has? You have to decide if the existing uh, prosthetic is appropriately close to the correct VDO and if it has adequate tooth positions. Um, I want to have just a brief discussion of tooth position here to kind of help us. Again, I apologize for those that this is review. We'll go kind of quickly. As you know, correct tooth uh, contour originates with the incisal edges of eight and nine. Uh, the maxillary centrals should have one to two millimeters of incisal edge display with the lip at rest and no more than two millimeters of gingiva should show above the teeth at high smile to prevent a gummy smile. So once you have those two positions, you have the incisal to gingival length of your centrals. Knowing that the width should be about 80% of the centrals, that gives you your central dimensions. Then you know your lateral length and width should be about 80% of the centrals and that the mesial aspect of the cuspid, the part of it that is from the height of contour to the mesial contact, should be about 80% of the width of the laterals. So once you have those two measurements, you know all your tooth positions, your, your tooth sizes. Um, the buccal lingual position of our maxillary anterior teeth, as you know, determines both the lip support and facial profile. Uh, we know that if we can put the incisal edge of the maxillary centrals on the wet dry line of the lower lip, it'll give us some really nice phonetics. Um, we want our midline horizontally positioned in alignment with the facial midline. So our dental and facial midlines, you know, aligned with each other and perpendicular to the interpupillary and commissural lines. Um, it's really important to discuss facial irregularities that make it difficult to locate the midline and kind of come to some agreement about what we're going to do. If a person's nose has a bit of a bend to it, are you going to follow that for the dental midline or are you going to position it more based on, um, you know, the midpoint of the, of the uh, eyes or something like that? Um, again, once you've made that decision, if there's a way that you can mock it up, that's really good so that the person can kind of experience that. But even if the provisional is the first time that the patient sees it, that's okay. Let's just make sure that we talk about what the nature of that provisional is. This is our, this is what we want to try, and then we'll make uh, adjustments uh, before we do the final restoration. I'm a big fan of communication before the fact. I think it makes things a lot better. So there's a few other rules of tooth position that we want to consider. We want our centrals flat to the front. Uh, you can follow the arch a little bit, but in general, the case looks good if the teeth look straight when viewed both from the incisal edge and in profile. Uh, we want cross arch symmetry as much as possible and pleasing proportions like we talked about. Um, in general, we want our uh, cuspids and centrals to match gingivally while the lateral should be about a millimeter shorter. The incisal edge of the lateral should be between half and a millimeter shorter. And then the length and shape of the incisal edge of the cuspid can be a real challenge. I feel like aesthetically that can be one of the more difficult parts of the case. Um, for some people, it's nice to have a little bit more point. For other people, just the way things line up, you can wind up having a lot of darkness around here and the person's tooth looks kind of faint. Uh, we want to make sure that our line angles on contralateral teeth are symmetric in size, position, and angulation. That's something most of the time that your dental lab is going to deal with. Um, we want all of our um, facial surfaces of the 
anterior teeth to be slightly convex. So incisal to gingival, mesial to distal, we want a little bit of positive curvature. It's funny, if you look at a tooth and you're like, this tooth looks weird, but I can't figure out why, a lot of times you'll see kind of a large area concavity is what you're seeing that looks weird. And then um, posteriorly, we want to develop even occlusion on the functional cusps and avoid, generally we want to avoid lateral interferences, but we kind of need to look at our implant distribution to decide, and I guess be deliberate about where we're going to apply our lateral occlusal forces. All right. So unless your patient arrives with adequate restorative space and integrated implants, you'll probably need some implants placed before beginning the restoration. We'll talk about the number and position of those implants as we go through the different restorative options, but there are a few general rules to consider. I think most folks on this are general dentists, and if that's the case, you're kind of the quarterback for the treatment. Giving your surgeon guidance about where the teeth are gonna go and thus where the implants uh, need to be will make your restoration much more successful for both of you. Um, as you guys know, implant placement is also the time at which bone reduction for restorative space or to hide the transition line for fixed restorations must be performed. Um, all on X surgeries can be done freehand or with various forms of guidance. In any case, you wanna make sure that your provisional prosthetic is being used to direct the implant placement. You can work with your surgeon in your lab to find the best guidance for a given case. Um, over here on the left, you see one of the simpler forms of guidance, which is a clear duplicate of the denture with a slot in it to visualize uh, implant positions. You can explore fully guided options. There's a lot of good ways out there to get the implants in the correct position, but you always wanna start with the correct tooth position. This is why early provisionalization is important because if you have an early provisional that has the tooth position, then you can definitely put the implants in the right spot. If, you're use, if there are any existing implants like we've talked about, you need to decide for the day of surgery if you're gonna use them or not. And then if you're not going to use them, whether you can bury them with a cover screw or um, if they need to be removed. If you're using any kind of resilient attachment, it's best if the implants are placed parallel to each other. Um, if this limits AP spread, you can plan angled implants and use angled locators on the posteriors. Um, it's helpful oftentimes to use a surgical guide for placing parallel implants. For those of you that have placed implants cross arch, you know that the bone doesn't lend itself well usually to parallel implants. And so a lot of times you gotta kind of push the envelope a little bit to, or let's say at least place against the anatomy of the ridge to get a really nice parallel implant. Um, most resilient attachments can adapt to non-parallel placement, but generally the more parallel the placement, the less wear and tear on the uh, attachments and the less maintenance that'll be required for the patient. There are there is, are some implant brands out there that have resilient attachments with um, advanced materials that can have better longevity, uh, longer service intervals, and so that may be something to consider. And then, last but not least, we want we usually want the widest implants that the ridge will allow, unless we're doing an FP1 case, which is kind of an animal of its own and would probably merit its own discussion. Um, we can use larger implants even in the anterior region because we're thinking of them more to support biomechanical wounds, biomechanical loads than as the originating point of contour with a FP3 like we would usually do. Transmucosal abutments. With very few exceptions, we'll usually be working to abutment when restoring these cases. Um, Anyone who's done very much with all on X has probably tried uh, going direct to fixture, but trying to go direct to five or six implants with the tissue moving around and all that stuff can be really frustrating. So getting the platforms to tissue level makes a big difference. For fixed acrylic hybrids, you usually use uh, the transmucosal abutments that are sometimes called multi-unit abutments here, as shown on the left. Um, many times we're placing our Posterior implants tilted on purpose to create better AP spread. And in those situations, we'll often use an 
uh, angled multi-unit abutment to try and get the restorative axes of our implants parallel. Um, with resilient attachments or econometric cases, you'll be taking a fixture level impression and selecting or creating the abutments as part of the restorative process. So you'll be more likely to deliver these during the restorative phase. These are usually delivered during the surgical phase. Oftentimes, you know, again, these cases vary so much, but if you're trying to create a restoration without significant alveoplasty, you're usually looking at a removable restoration. I saw an interesting study out of India actually that indicated that the average amount of restorative space for current denture wearers by our definition, in other words, bone to plane of occlusion is 9.5 millimeters. There aren't a lot of implant supported solutions for that little bit of restorative space. Um, but if you can open the VDO a little bit, you can get to the 11 and a quarter millimeters of space, which is needed for a locator. I'll show that on the next slide. Other solutions will probably require alveoplasty before placement. So we're gonna start out by talking about these resilient attachments, which work like snaps on a shirt, basically. You probably will see a variety of these attachments in your practice. Um, but I think you and your patients are gonna be best served by choosing a system and using that one. Um, on the slide here, you see three, the ERA, the ball attachment, and the locator. I would say of these, the locator is the most common. And oftentimes it's a good solution to use for your patients, um, not only because it's easy to work with, but because in this day and age when people are very mobile, um, if your patient is picked up for maintenance over the years by another clinician, they're going to be more likely to be familiar with that and be able to get the components and just make it a little easier for, for your patient to get good maintenance over their lifetime. So this is kind of how that 11.25 millimeters works out in the anterior region for a locator case. Um, like we talked about, these attachments have male and female components which snap together. The male component is the abutment, which is affixed to the implant with a screw and torqued to the manufacturer's specific uh, recommendations. Now it's interesting, regardless of each locator for each kind of implant is of course different, but the superstructure is always the same. So let's say you are doing a case where you're retaining an implant or two. If you can get a locator for that implant, it allows you to have your restorative platform, the locator abutment, to be the same. The female component consists of a metal housing and a nylon insert, and it's embedded in the acrylic of the prosthetic. The embedding can happen either chairside or in the lab, and we'll talk a little bit about how to handle this processing and the steps for both methods as we move along. So a lot of times this treatment is initially less expensive and that's fine, that's good. I think that's a good thing to talk with about your patients, but it's probably going to be more expensive for maintenance over time. You'll need to be able to replace the uh, little resilient attachments the locator housing itself wears out. Um, and especially with a two locator prosthetic, you're still mucostatic. So you may have bone loss over time that will require relines. Um, a four locator will avoid a lot of that, which can be good. Um, but all these things, if you talk to your patient ahead of time and then you, you start doing maintenance, it's okay. It's what you talked about. Problem is, is if we don't have good communication ahead of time, and then the patient thinks, oh, well, I'm going to do this treatment, I'm never doing anything again. It's like, well, no, you're actually going to be coming in every six months so that we can uh, check and potentially maintain your prosthetic. So discussing that ahead of time, having a, a good conversation about fees and service intervals, if you will, will really just make the experience much more pleasant for both of you. Locator cases can be restored with the smallest number of implants and often without alveoplasty. As we talked about, that often makes them the most affordable implant retained restorative option. If you have a patient with a denture that just flops around, they don't want to spend very much money on it, and they want to get some more stability, two locators can be a great solution. 
Um, there's been some I, change in the recommendation of um, where we should put those two locators. When I was younger, it seemed like I saw a lot of them in the cuspid position, but in recent years, I think it's been discussed that it's very important to get them aligned with each other. Most of the time now we recommend putting them in the kind of the distals of the lateral position in a straight line so that we only have one direction of cantilever as opposed to anterior and posterior cantilevers that can lead to rocking. Um, restorative space is a good thing to think about with these cases. If you're close to 15 millimeters and you can gain a little bit of restorative space around those um, implants, then you could place them using these two locators and talk with your patient about maybe a stage treatment where you go to a four locator case or a screw tang case or a conus case, something else in the future that's a little more stable for them. Uh, four parallel locators is very, very stable. It is going to have a, it is still uses resilient attachment. So it'll have a little bit of give to it, but it'll be a nice uh, stable case. You can add more implants, but in general, they tend to be a little bit over retentive. So it seems like four kind of the magic number for a more stable case. Uh, I mentioned this before, but it's probably worth circling back again that um, you can get, you're more likely to have increased uh, bone resorption in the posterior region of a two locator case than you will in any of the other uh, solutions that we're talking about. This is a relatively recent development, but if we have some severely angled implants, there are now um, 17 and 30 degree locator abutments that are angled that you can, uh, you can take advantage of. One other thing to keep in mind, and I, I found this very interesting, is the locator bar. Um, these are much more stable than individuals. And if you put a little bit of a cantilever off the distal here, if you're doing a, a cantilevered case, these can be quite stable. And they, from an engineering perspective, they kind of appeal to me because it's like, okay, we got cross arch stabilization and all that stuff. I would have thought that, um, that these are actually going to be more stable. A uh, 2019 study I saw in uh, International Journal of Prosthodontics out of Italy, it was a meta study, um, actually showed that these cases tend to have more implant failures than single locators. And, and they, the authors determined that it was primarily due to hygienic concerns. So if you're looking at these kind of cases and you're like, I wanna do a bar, then you need to make sure your standards for hygiene are gonna have to be as high for this as they would be for a screw retained fix. So if you have a patient who you are concerned about their hygiene skills, if you will, or their hygiene habits, you may want to do single locators as opposed to a bar. Let's say you want to go ahead and measure for your locator abutments. Of course, you'll need to know the brand line and size of the implants because, again, they'll be specific to those implants. Um, you go ahead and remove the healing abutment with your appropriate driver, and then you'll measure to the highest point of the gingiva from the implant platform, as shown here. Um, when you order the abutments, you order them based on the tissue height, and then, then fine folks at locator have added a millimeter and a half for the super gingival part. Um, oftentimes you won't find the exact height you want. Make sure you round up because you need to have this. It's better that this component be a little bit above the tissue than a little bit below because otherwise the tissue kind of wants to pop those components up, which can be a frustration for you. If you have, obviously this is a diagram, so the implants are perfectly parallel. If you have divergent implants, there's this cool little tool you can get uh, to look at the divergence of the implants and decide if you need to do extended range or if you can use um, a standard range uh, components. So once you've taken your measurements, you'll go ahead and replace the healing abutments. And if you want a custom tray, it's a great time to get it made because you can take your study cast when you have the patient in for doing your measurements. So once you, you get those measurements done and you're getting ready to take your master impression, you kind of need want to decide, am I going to activate the locators? In other words, cure the attachments in, 
chair side or do I want the laboratory to do it? Um, of course, either is fine. Um, if you have a patient who has really good, well-fit denture and you're adding a couple locators, that may be a good procedure to handle chair side. Um, if you're doing a whole bunch of locators or you're doing a new denture or whatever, a lot of times it's easier to have your laboratory cure them when the, when the prosthetic's being made. So we'll talk about taking the impression first. So if you wanna take an impression, you'll need to get some impression coping. This is what the impression copings look like. I, I think of them as an upside down wine goblet. Um, and so what you'll wanna do is put the black, they come with the black processors in there, snap those on the locators once the locators are torqued in place. Um, next, you'll wanna make sure that your trace sits, of course, without interfering with these. And then you'll do your usual four-handed dentistry, inject your light body material around those um, attachments and onto the crest of the ridge can be nice. And then have your assistant load the tray with medium or heavy body. And uh, you'll take the impression and pick those up. It's a closed tray technique. Um, and then in general, once you've torqued the locators, leave them in there. Don't put the healing abutments back in. And they could be a little taller than the healing abutment, so you'll want to um, relieve a little bit on the denture internally to make sure that it seats properly. If you have a denture that's nice and you wanna go ahead and cure the attachments into the uh, prosthetic yourself, that's perfectly fine. You'll put the black processors in the housing, and then there's a little block out spacer that you'll put over the locator first. So you wanna snap these firmly into place then you'll need to get some kind of marking material and make sure that your denture will seat passively and fully over the locators. I like to have a little vent hole towards the lingual as well. I think it just helps with uh, seating passively. So then you wanna, um, once you've got your denture seating passively, you wanna use a um, PMMA resin, uh, fill the, your new holes that you made in the prosthetic, at least two thirds full. Uh, sometimes a little bit more. Better to have a little bit extra because you really want those to pick up. And then you'll you'll seat the prosthetic with finger pressure, and then have the patient hold it gently with their jaw um, to you know even out the bite a little bit uh, while the material is setting. Then once you remove it, you'll have a little bit of flash probably around the attachments here. You'll get rid of your little blockout spacers, and you'll need to finish anything that comes through the vent. You'll use your three-in-one tool to remove the black processors and always start with the least retentive insert and then you can deliver the denture and uh, dismiss the patient. So this is one of those things, it's gonna take a fair amount of chair time to do it, but you can deliver the whole prosthetic in one appointment. So if you wanna do that, that's certainly an option for you. We'll kind of continue now with the procedure for using, the, um, using your impression. So if you've taken an impression with the locators, your laboratory has locator analogs. So they'll snap those in the impression code, kind of like with an implant case and make a model. Then they'll make a base plate and a bite block and send them to you to capture the bite. The base plate won't be attached to the locators, but also not interfere with them. Um, you should be able to seat the base plate in the mouth without doing anything with the locator attachments. And you wanna take your bite as usual, Keep in mind that the bite rim is kind of the pre-setup. If you cut the plane of occlusion so it's in a perfect spot, level the buckle so that it's where the teeth ought to be, um, both in the anterior region and in the posterior for buckle corridor, um, and of course, mark the midline, high smile, cuspid position, you'll be amazed by how much more predictable your setups are. If you can visualize this surface, as the place where your teeth are going to go, that'll really help your laboratory and help yourself. Um, your laboratory will articulate the case with your bite, cross, cross mouth the study model of the current patient's current restoration, and set the teeth based on the shape of the bite block and any photos that you've provided. Once you receive the case, again, you'll try it in like a normal denture. Um, you want to check your occlusion and function as well as your aesthetics. Um, as much as possible in the laboratory, what we're trying to do at after the trying appointment is we're trying to duplicate that exactly with your final restoration. So you wanna be a little bit picky at the trying because that's when you can kind of 
it's easier to move things in in uh, in wax than plastic. That's why we do it. Um, I like also to encourage folks to always take a bite over the try-in. Even if it looks good, doesn't hurt anything, we can fine tune. It's easier for people to bite down when they have teeth. So we can just remount the case when we get it and make sure that we get uh, a perfect bite for your final restoration. So once your try ins verified, the lab will process the denture curing the male attachments in place at the same time. And then they'll remove those black processors and snap the least pretended male inserts into the prosthetic. You should only have to give the patient the denture at delivery. A little nod to uh, a digital, a new scan body that's out there. Um, there is a scan body for locators, but at, as of now, as last time I looked into it was a couple months ago, it's not possible to position an analog off of this you can only create a space. So essentially this will create a space for you to do a uh, chair side placement. So if you wanna do that, great. This can be a wonderful tool for you. If you want to have your lab process the uh, attachments, it's probably better to use the impressions and those little copings that we were talking about, the wine goblet. Um, again, this is a topic that deserves its own um, presentation, but it is possible with the new locator fix to convert a case that has four locators from a removable case to a fixed case. Um, well, I'm, there's lots of great education opportunities about that. I'm not going to dig into that too much right now. So another removable situation uh, solution is CONUS, and it's something that's been around for a long time, but a lot of people haven't heard of it yet. Um, so CONUS consists of a custom abutment that uh, is attached to the implant. There's no MUAs with these cases. And then a gold alloy cap that is buried in the prosthetic. Um, the way it actually works is that the gold alloy syncone is slightly deformed by the titanium abutment so that they're a friction fit. When a CONUS case is seated, it has no movement at all. It's just as rigid as a screw retain case but the patient can remove it and they actually need to remove it uh, daily just to make sure they don't. Uh, if they do get stuck, you can remove them with a crown popper pretty readily. So that, that is an option as well. But one of the cool things about CONUS is that you can put on as much flange as you want if you've got to hide a transition line or none, which is fine. Um, and it gives your removable patients the option of having that solid stability that in the past was only really, I guess you could say, relegated to screw retaining cases. Um, most of the time, we don't want to do more than one molar of cantilever. So like a two molar like this probably isn't the best idea. Um, they do have an internal framework in them, but we want to be careful not to overload that framework. Um, again, a cool workflow, and I have some good information about this, actually. Um, but not something that I can really dig into deep at this point. So uh, reach out separately to Jessica. If you want that information, I'll get it for you. So we've kind of talked about removable restorations. So now we're gonna flip over to fixed restorations. So I would say still the acrylic hybrid is the most common type of fixed full arch implant supported restoration. This is what was being done way back when, when Dr. Uh, Mallow first uh, develop the all on four protocol. So as you guys probably know, this restoration uses the CAD cam titanium bar that's directly affixed to the multi-unit abutments with screws in the office. The bar supports uh, acrylic teeth and both the teeth and bar are surrounded by pink acrylic. Uh, the acrylic encirclement sometimes explains why these restorations are called wraparounds bars. It's a proven restoration. But like all denture tooth and acrylic solutions, it can fail when maybe the teeth break out of the acrylic or because of staining. Um, it's really important if you do one of these cases that you retain the provisional. If anything happens to the final restoration, it's nice to have something that works well for the patient and that you can deliver to them while some work's being done. You can assume that at some point you're gonna need a retread, which is where the bar is retained and the teeth and resin are replaced. Um, takes about a week to do. It's kind of a pain to do. And um, your patient's going to want some teeth. Um, 
speaking for folks who have done a lot of these, don't let the patient save the provisional, you save it because they're not going to care about it until they really, really want it. And then it'll be your fault that they don't have it. So <laughs> my advice would be keep it in the office. Um, as you guys know, there's a full art zirconia now, nano ceramics, some other products out there. Um, so, but again, to kind of limit the scope of this discussion to something we can do in a little over an hour, I see I'm coming up here. Um, I wanted to just talk about acrylic. As a side note, this is a good example of what not to do. You notice how my little slide here shows uh, a ridge lap. These screw retain restorations are very difficult to keep clean. And us laboratories need to help the patients by making this surface at worst flat and at best convex. And I think you guys can help out by uh, kind of gently nudging your laboratories if they haven't quite done that. So I wanna make sure that we, um, we get something that's very hygienic for the patient. These prosthetics are gonna require 15 millimeters restorative space, but we can have up to 1.5 times AP spread if we want, with the caveats we mentioned about potential issues with uh, prosthetic stability over time. So let's talk about what we do, kind of like I walked through the locator thing, we'll walk through the uh, clinical appointments briefly, like how would you uh, handle these cases? So this is, let's say you have the, the MUAs are in, the implants are healed, and you're ready to begin this case restoratively. So um, we need a series of photos. Start out with the photos of what the patient is wearing now. We want to see a relaxed lip, high smile profile from both sides, and a study of the impression in, of the provisional in place. Um, if the patient's happy with it, of course, we're going to want to follow it. But even if the person's not happy, it gives us a, a starting reference point that we can move from that. It's also very nice to take a bite between the provisional and the opposing and, of course, an opposing impression. Next, you're going to need to remove the provisional prosthetic and take an impression of the MUAs. The impression needs to have borders like a denture just to make it easier to cross mount and work with. And... Um, so if you have the current generation of iOS, you can certainly take a scan as long as it will capture your scan bodies adequately and all the soft tissue that needs to be done. Um, if you're going to take a physical impression, you should always take an open tray for this. So you'll send the case to the laboratory and your laboratory will start out by making your model work. Um, if possible, your laboratory could cross mount the case get an early mounting with a palatal transfer for a maxillary case. In general, we'll just mount up the study models and then we'll make a verification jig and a screw retained bite bar. A verification jig, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a group of temporary cylinders that are rigidly connected with either acrylic or stone. The goal of the verification jig, and we'll talk how we, about how we use it in a minute, is to make sure that the model and the mouth are exactly the same before we start uh, making very expensive prosthetics on them. Um, of course, the bite block, the caveats I said before, the more that you shape the bite block and get everything that you need on there that show your laboratory where the teeth ought to be, the nicer the setup is going to go. So you get the clinic, the second clinical appointment after you get the verification jig and the bite block. So first thing you'll do is, of course, remove the provisional, and then you'll take the verification jig and you'll hand tighten all the sites, then remove all but one of the screws and take a, take a radiograph or if you can visualize it, that's okay too. You wanna make sure that every single site is fully seated with only one screw in. If that's not the case, then that means there's something wrong with the master cast. And so I don't know if I'd recommend doing this, but in this case, you can see that we have two implants that weren't accurate. So it had to be cut here, cut here, looted with a low shrinkage resin, like a GC pattern resin or something like that, and then returned to the laboratory. Um, that test uh, where you screw down all the screws and then you remove all but one is called a modified Sheffield test. So once you've gotten your, uh, your verification jig done, hopefully you don't have to cut it, uh, then you'll 
you'll do your screw retaining bite block. Usually that's affixed with two implants. Again, you'll want to make sure you get the correct VDO, correct centric relation. Um, you'll go ahead and shoot up the wax as a simulation of where the teeth ought to go and return those to your laboratory. So your laboratory, well, now we can mount the master model to cross mount it with the study model using that new bite block. Uh, you can get a mock-up then of the final restoration it can be done either out of milled PMMA or denture teeth set in wax. With a hybrid case like this, in general, you're gonna want the teeth set in wax because then we can use those same teeth for the final restoration. Mock-up needs to be screw retained. And we want to have the desired tooth position and occlusal scheme of the final restoration. Also, the wax should be contoured to have a hygienic relationship with the ridge. So when you get that restoration back, you'll want to go ahead and affix it to the MUAs and check it and be picky. Your laboratory, as much as possible, is going to try to exactly duplicate that in the final restoration. So of course you want to check the bite function, all that stuff. Want to check for cheek biting or um, make sure lips and cheek are well supported. Make sure the case is well designed hygienically. Phonetics are good. Um, again, I would recommend taking a bite over the setup just to make sure we perfect it as much as possible. Um, go ahead and take another series of photos at this appointment so that if you need any changes made, your laboratory can see, okay, this is how it looked in the person's mouth, be able to uh, make those changes predictably. So then your insure laboratory has a tooth position, uh, remount that master model based on your new bite. And we're gonna make every effort to exactly duplicate the mock-up. First, we'll use the mock-up as a guide for fabricating that titanium bar. Um, we'll usually, most labs use OEM bars. Uh, you'll wanna check into that because if, if you're not, then the, it may invalidate the warranty on your implant. So keep an eye on that. Um, once the bar is made, the setup is transferred to the bar and you can either try that in in wax or you can go straight to finish if you like. The case is usually finished by uh, injecting the resin around the bar. So, and this is the payoff you get to You've done all the work. You've kind of front loaded your work. Your, your case should be very predictable to deliver. Um, the changes that you wanted have been made. You've already verified the bite. You already verified the prosthetics. So this should be mostly a talk about maintenance and both sides, maintenance that the patient can do at home and also any maintenance that you may need to do clinically. Um, one of the analogies that people like to use is they say, if you buy a brand new Mercedes, you probably wouldn't plan on just driving it home and never changing the oil. You'd probably bring it in and do your oil changes, make it last longer. And sometimes an analogy like that can help a person understand um, why they need to have their, uh, why they need to come into the office and uh, get their maintenance done. One of the cool things about this is if you've never done one of these cases, these appointments are great because you really see everybody, it seems like everything that's out there says, oh, this will change your life. That'll change your life. I've seen so many of these and you see people crying. You see their spouses or their significant others crying. I mean, it's amazing the change this makes in people's lives. I think that's probably the most cool part of this is the way that you really see, wow, this is what I got into dentistry for. I want to change people's lives. I want to make them better.